Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Berkman Center's Tuesday Luncheon Series. Um, if you have not been over here before, we have a special luncheon talk this week because we've moved venues over to Wasserstein Hall because of the interest in this topic with Kate. Uh, before we get started, a couple of quick logistical announcements if you've not been here before. One is that we are being webcasted, and we will record this talk and put it on the Berkman Center website afterwards. Uh, please just note that, and if you're not comfortable with that, you can hang out and watch the website, the webcast outside. Um, additionally, if you are watching online, please use the hashtag Berkman. If you are in the room, you can also use that hashtag to talk about the talk on Twitter or ask questions. Um, the second is that we typically go around the room and introduce ourselves at these Tuesdays. We won't do that today because there's a ton of people here. But during the Q&A, if you just want to identify yourself before asking the question, that um, will be helpful. Um, and finally, uh, we're here to welcome Kate Darling um, to talk to us about robot ethics. Kate is a Berkman Center, Center Fellow this year. She is also a IP research specialist at the MIT Media Lab, and she's also getting her PhD um, in IP pro Intellectual Property and Law and Economics at ETH Zurich. Um, you should follow her on Twitter. She's at Groke underscore. Uh, welcome, Kate. Hello, hello. Is the microphone working? All right. Yes, no, maybe? Yes, OK. Oh my god, there are a gazillion people here. <laughs> uh, I assume you all came for the free lunch like I did. but. Thank you for coming, regardless. Um, it's not every day that I get to float my wacky ideas in a room full of brilliant Cambridge people. So uh, I do want to make this maybe less of a lunch talk and more of a lunch conversation, if we can. Uh, so I'll present for maybe 20 minutes, and then I really want to open it up to some discussion, hopefully. So um, I just want to start by saying, uh, as Amar mentioned, I am an intellectual property scholar. Um, I'm a couple weeks away from defending a dissertation on copyright, and it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with robots or with ethics. Um, so people have been asking me, you know, why have you decided to work on this now? And some of you might also be wondering, you know, why in the world I'm even qualified to be working on this? And I, I really think the answer to both of those questions is that Currently, nobody is. So there's a handful of people. There are a couple psychologists. There are a few roboticists. There's a handful of legal scholars that are working on the intersection of law and robotics. But really, it's a little bit terrifying that the few of us are being hailed as experts in this like non-existent field, when really, I think that we still need to step up to the plate and become experts in this. Um, so I've decided to devote some time in the near future to this. Why I think this is relevant, um, so we have robotic technology increasingly moving into a lot of different areas in our lives, moving into healthcare, the military, transportation, education, elderly care, children's toys, uh, and our households. And, um, you know, a lot of these areas raise some ethical issues, and I'm not entirely sure that our current laws are equipped to deal with all of the problems that we're going to face. Or at least, you know, you could say they deserve reconsideration in light of this transformative technology coming into so many areas. And so the same way that cyber law kind of creates a space for exploration and for expertise in, in an interdisciplinary field, looking at the effects of a new technology, um, Ryan Kahlo from the University of Washington, who's probably going to go down in history as the pioneer of law and robotics, he has been pushing recently this idea that we should create this space, kind of a cyber law-like space for robotics um, to, to study it more. And I really just want to echo that here and say I think there's not just space for it, there's really a need for us to be working together with roboticists and looking at this. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that at the end. But first, I just want to give you a quick overview of so uh, robot ethics and issues that we feel you know, off of the top of our heads could deserve some consideration in the near future or now. Um, and so those fit into three broad categories. And oh, 
I would like to talk more about these in the discussion if you want. I, I'm going to be focusing on one aspect in particular that I've been working on, but just to give you an overview. The first category is safety and liability. So we have increasingly autonomous technology. It's going to make the chain of causality for harm get longer and more complex. And you know we have legal rules that will assign responsibility, but uh, we might want to be rethinking whether those responsibilities are still assigned in a way that's optimal, in a way that's going to minimize harm and set the right incentives. Um, and it gets more complicated even when you talk about programming ethical decisions into machines. Uh, this is something that sounds very science fiction-y, but actually we are very close to, or, or maybe we're even there, to needing to program autonomous vehicles, for instance, or maybe even autonomous drones to interact with their surroundings and identify what they're interacting with. And so we're going to have what are inherently ethical decisions in, in code and who's responsible for that, who's making those decisions. The second category is, <laughs> is not restric restricted to robotics, obviously. Privacy, as you may or may not have heard if you've been at Berkman recently, is a huge deal. Generally, um, robotic technology does introduce new ways of collecting data, though. And interestingly, it introduces new ways that people tend to react much more viscerally to than you know, having their email monitored by the NSA. So this might even offer some opportunity to push some issues that aren't getting enough consideration in other areas. And then the third category that I'm personally most interested in right now is social issues. So the ethics of our social interactions with robots, the ethics of elderly care, of child care, moral value issues like sexual behavior, and so forth. And so what I'm interested in specifically, or fascinated by right now, is one aspect, which is our tendency to project lifelike qualities onto robotic objects. So we have more and more robots entering into our lives and our homes that are specifically designed to interact with us on a social level. And what studies are starting to show is that we perceive and we treat these objects very differently than we do other types of objects. So we project onto them. We give them personality and we ascribe intent and states of mind and feelings to them. And so psychologists, for example, you may know of Sherry Turkle at MIT, are, are starting to make a really powerful case that we bond with these objects really surprisingly strongly. Now, you can say, OK, so what? Like, we've, we've always bonded with objects. People fall in love with all sorts of things. They fall in love with their cars, with their phones, stuffed animals. People will bond with virtual objects and video games. But we believe that this effect is stronger for robots. And we believe it's stronger because of the interplay of three factors. The first two are physicality. We're very physical creatures, so we react differently to something in our physical space than we do to something on a, on a screen. Um, and then if you introduce perceived autonomous behavior. So it doesn't need to be a lot. If something is moving around in a way that we can't entirely anticipate what it's going to do next, that already lends itself to us projecting onto it. So if you take this simple robot vacuum cleaner, the Roomba, it's not designed to be your friend. It's not designed to distinguish between you and the chairs. And yet, just the fact that it's moving around on its own will cause people to name it. They'll feel bad when it gets stuck in the curtain. It's, kind of, it's ridiculous. Um, a much more extreme example of this is military robots. So there were some articles on this recently, but we've known for a while that robots and military teams often get named, and the soldier, soldiers will bond with them. They'll give them medals of honor. If, if they get you know, damaged, they will insist that they get them repaired and not replaced. They want the same one back. If, if you know, they can't get repaired, then they'll have a funeral for it. So this is, and I mean, you could say, well, OK, maybe this is social dynamics. Maybe this is you know, some circumstances in the military, like serious circumstances. But we really think that a lot of this is just projection. I guess one of my favorite stories in the military context is this robot that they developed um, to 
diffuse landmines, and it was shaped like a stick insect, so it had six legs, and it would walk around on a minefield, and every time it stepped on a mine, one of its legs would blow up, and it would just continue on the other legs. And the colonel who was in charge of testing it um, ended up calling off the exercise because he said it was inhumane, and he just, <laughs> he couldn't stand the sight of this thing, like, dragging itself along on its remaining legs. So, <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing here is that these robots aren't designed to do that, right? We, we project onto them anyway. And so if you introduce the third factor, which is social robots that are specifically designed to target our emotional buttons, then that really lends itself to this type of anthropomorphism. So these robots are, you know, they're designed to use sound and movement and mimic uh, ex expressions that we automatically associate with states of mind and feelings. Uh, and so this is, this is a pleodinosaur. The one on the right is called Yoshi. He's named after Yochai Benkler. They have met in person. <laughs> um, we, had a, we, we did a workshop at a conference, my friend Hannes and I, and we gave groups of six, they, they each got a Pleo, they named it, they played with it, they did stuff with it, and then we asked them to torture and kill them. And they were horrified, like they had trouble even striking the things. And uh, well, in the end, we did get them to destroy one of them, but only because we started playing mind games and we were like, okay, we're gonna destroy all of the Pleos if you guys don't kill one of them. And they did, it was very dramatic. Uh, but so what we came away from this feeling and, and what studies are increasingly showing is that we respond to social cues from these lifelike machines. And we do so even if we know that they're not real, right? These were adults. They, they knew that these robots had been purchased specifically to be destroyed, but they didn't want to do it. So now, why are we talking about this? Um, there are people who say that this bonding effect that we have is a bad thing, that we should discourage it um, or prevent it from happening. And I, while I understand some of their arguments, I, I'm not sure how I feel about this because first of all, you know, good luck preventing this. We obviously really like doing it. You're not gonna stop toy companies from developing this type of engaging technology. So, but even more importantly, you know, there are so many great uses for this stuff. We're already seeing amazing, you know, fantastic results in autism patients, in dementia patients. You can imagine that for education, the possibilities are endless if you have this type of engagement. So really, do we really want to give all of that opportunity up? But of course, you know, I recognize that there are some issues if we embrace this, if we encourage this type of, you know, human robot bonding. Um, and so like in that, in that workshop that I did, people were very uh, uncomfortable with seeing these objects treated in a way that they didn't agree with. And so, you know, one idea is if we're going to encourage perceiving these objects as objects with a special status, you know, at some point we might need to start treating them as objects with a special status. So, I mean, bear with me here. We protect animals from abuse <coughs> or from overly cruel behavior. And why do we do that? Is it really because the animals actually feel pain? Um, or is it more because we relate to them, we're projecting onto them, they are you know, giving off these cues that we automatically associate with our own feelings. And I think one argument for the latter is our differential treatment of animals that doesn't seem to have much to do with their inherent capabilities in culture or even in law. So in America, for instance, we don't like eating horses because, you know, horses. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I'm European, so for me it's like, but horses and cows are both delicious. What's the difference? So, um, but you know, even, even if you don't agree with that, if you say that's not why we protect animals, it's because they actually feel something, or even if you do agree with that and you say, okay, but 
you know, protection for social robots is going a little bit too far because, you know, animals do actually feel pain and we know that robots don't. So I do just want to leave you with two additional thoughts, though, why we could, we might want to discuss this as a possibility. So the first is that we increasingly will have parts of our society that don't completely understand or that have difficulty understanding the difference between lifelike and alive. So you have elderly people, you have small children. Like, how are you going to teach a small child that it's not okay to kick, uh, or it is okay to kick a robot, it's okay to see a video on YouTube of people kicking a robot, but it's not okay to kick a cat. And, but more importantly, we might want to discourage behavior that's harmful in other contexts, generally. So the Kantian argument for animal rights was never about the animals. It was always about our societal values. Kant says, we can judge the heart of a man by his treatment of animals. For he who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealing with men. And we know that these types of behavior tend to translate. And if torturing a, a thing that responds in a lifelike manner causes us discomfort and feels wrong, you know, there could be reasons why that feels wrong to us that we don't want to get rid of in other contexts. So, you know, taking away that piece of empathy within us, it's, it's not really clear whether that would translate, and there's some indication that it does. So in other contexts, we do have uh, correlations in this behavior. For instance, in some states, if you have an animal abuse case in a household, that will automatically trigger an investigation into child abuse if there's a child in the same household because these behaviors correlate. So really, this isn't at all about you know, protecting objects. It's about thinking about societal values and thinking about encouraging behavior that, that we want. Um, so before I open it up, I just, just two final notes. Um, the, so that, that workshop that I did with the PLEOs wasn't very scientific, obviously. It was just a workshop. But I do plan to do some uh, experiments where we're replicating that in a controlled setting and looking at what's actually going on. And, you know, I'm still in the brainstorming phase of that. I want to look at, you know, what social, social dynamics, what role social dynamics play, like the difference between physical things and virtual things, uh, how much interaction you need in order to bond with something, et cetera. But if anyone wants to talk about this or anyone knows anyone who's interested in this or working on this, please put me in touch with them. I know Peter Kahn and people at the University of Washington are, are doing some of this stuff, but I don't really know many other people. So uh, there's that. And then I just want to say again that we need more people working on this. Um, I mean, maybe not anthropomorphism specifically, although I do, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think my experiments are important and interesting because they deal with this murky area that right now, you know, very few people are even aware of this, that this could even be an issue. Whereas, you know, drone warfare and autonomous vehicles and medical procedure robots are getting a lot of attention right now because, or they're getting comparatively more attention because they have effects that are, are very dramatic and visible at the moment. And, um, but I, I, I think that generally this whole field really needs more people and we need to be talking to each other more. We need roboticists talking to legal scholars and the other way around. I think it benefits both sides. I think, it, you know, even the roboticists, like I don't want to restrict anyone's research and development. I don't want to freak anyone out. But, you know, it's a fact that if you're thinking a little bit about the effects of what you're building, there are points in time where you can make certain design decisions that go one way or another. And if you're thinking a little bit about data security, you might make a decision. And that's important because once standards get adopted, they're very hard to change. So there's that. And then, you know, on the, on the other side, we, we are not exactly known legal scholars for our technical expertise. And so we really need to be talking to the people who are developing these emerging te technologies because otherwise we'll miss out on very interesting and important legal questions. And, you know, I don't know. I, I think Cambridge is a great place to start doing interdisciplinary work on this. So I would just, that's my message. Please, please support interdisciplinary work. Um, and with that, you know, I, I hope we can get a good discussion going.
I do want to, uh, I don't know, I don't know if we're supposed to use the microphones because of the live stream. No, yeah, yeah. I would encourage everyone though to like, if you disagree with something someone's saying, you know, challenge it. If you have a better answer to a question, please speak up, you know, please. Hi, thanks for that talk. Um, my name is Jessa. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the Social Media Collective at Microsoft Research. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first was, I might have just missed it, but I wasn't totally sure what the definition of robot that you are using was. Um, so I wanted to ask about that. And then I also wanted to ask about um, like maybe a different part of, of ethics around robots. Something about, like I used to be a, more of a labor activist. And so I was wondering about the conversations that are, aren't starting about, you know, like labor, like the effect of labor that goes into so much of the anthropomorphization, you know, how, what kind of protections would there be for, for that? You know, I can almost imagine it being the other way, sort of like you were talking about, we need to protect robots because it makes us better people, but it also sort of does something about like, protecting robots as a way of signaling our care for other workers. Okay, I'm not, I, I'm gonna ask you again about the second question, but, so the first question, uh, thank you for asking, this is, that's an excellent one. So if, you know, if we're talking about, you know, even legal regulations uh, for, for social robots, obviously we need a really good definition of what that is. Um, my idea of the definition would be something that's a physical object that has, you know, a certain kind of autonomy as defined by robotics, and that's specifically designed to interact with us socially. And, you know, I realize that that's not a perfect definition, and it would take some work. And, of course, you know, any line you're going to draw is going to be arbitrary in some way. But, on the other hand, the law deals with that type of thing all of the time, so it's no reason not to try, and I think we would come up with something. So that's the, the definitional question. So the second one, I'm not sure, I thought. So I guess there's been a discussion on the IDC listserv, I don't know how many of you are on that, about uh, hyper labor and like underemployment, hyperemployment and underemployment. And so I started thinking about uh, servers and like how much labor they're doing all the time. And if you've ever worked somewhere where the servers went down, like suddenly you realize all this labor is going on all the time. Um, and so I was thinking ah, okay. from a work, from a labor, standpoint, there's this question about we protect, we do a pretty good job of protecting hours that people can work, but we don't do that for machines um, until they break and then we get rid of them. Um, so I was wondering if you wanted to have, if you wanted to, I'm not completely sure I buy your arguments, but if I were going to, I could extend it to be like, yes, and we should also unionize the robots. <laughs> so I believe in, you know, granting protections and rights according to everyone's, you know, actual needs. And I, I would be hard pressed to come up with, you know, a reason to protect robots from working long hours since I don't see any evidence that they mind doing that. Um, <laughs> so, so like my idea of, of, you know, protecting robots is more, uh, it would be closer to animal abuse protection, but of course it would find a line where there's an actual difference between robots and animals and that you can work an animal to death. And if you work a robot to death, that's maybe less of, a, of an issue. Whereas, you know, setting it on fire on YouTube might cause some, some social distress. So I'm really not interested in protecting the inherent, you know, robot, at least not until we see the type of AI that they talk about in science fiction. I don't know if that answers your question. Would you, would you want to protect robots? in the labor force? I guess I was, I was going along with you in the idea that it's like the Kantian notion of we should be protecting, we should be good to animals because it signals that we are, are norms of care in a society. So if you have, if you're concerned as I am about like, you know, issues of labor and like protecting workers' rights, then maybe that would be a good way to signal, like just trying to draw that parallel. I, I, I like the idea. I've never thought of that. No, I really like it. It's fun. Um, uh, ask the, uh, uh, Adrian Grappa, patient privacy rights. Uh, the relationship between intellectual property in robots and ethics uh, in the sense that um, animals and people uh, are not intellectual property. They're, they're innovation and changes happen at the edge 
in the family, in the farm, in whatever. Um, how important is something like open source uh, software in the robots so that from an ethical point of view, we match this idea of local intervention, local rules, and not having centralized control built into the system. Oh, wow, this is a, this is a big one. I mean, and there's, <laughs> there are two ways to answer that. I can answer, you know, what I think should happen, and I can answer what's probably going to happen. Um, I think in robotics, you're, right now you have, you, ha you have a hardware side and you have a software side. And um, probably if intellectual property laws stay the way they are now and the landscape doesn't change much, you're going to see a similar development as in you know, computers and smartphones where uh, you're going to have hopefully proprietized systems with some open source types of apps and stuff, although that raises other liability questions that people are thinking about. Um, I guess, you know, what, what answer do you want from me? Like, I, <laughs> I'm obviously very biased when it comes to IP, and I'm skewed towards open systems and keeping things open so that everyone can innovate, but I'm, I'm not sure that that can or will happen. Can There's a mic. Yeah, is there a microphone? Let, let me try to build on this in a way that I, I, I think might be compatible. Hi, Ethan Zuckerman, Center for Civic Media. Um, you referenced drones and ethics sort of early on in this talk. <clears throat> and you referenced the really intriguing idea that I would love for you to expand on a little bit of the idea that we might at some point try to create machinery that has ethical judgment and is trying to figure out, we know we have a target here that we have been targeted to hit, but we also have visual evidence that perhaps there are children nearby who might be harmed by this. How do we have that robot make that ethical decision whether to strike or not strike? That's an intriguing issue, but there's another intriguing issue behind it, which is we can easily imagine a defense contractor saying, we have the finest Harvard-trained ethicists working for us on our ethical algorithms, which are part of our trade secrets and can never be revealed. Otherwise, the Chinese will have robots more ethical than ours. <laughs> if we hit a point where we have to do ethical review of algorithm, does this push us into a space where we really start demanding that this stuff be open source so that we can actually review those ethical choices that are being made in our name, through our military, through our algorithms and our drones? You know, I think, it, I think a lot of these questions have been explored already in the cyber law space. And, but my hope is that with, you know, actual physical drones out there killing people that people will actually drive this discussion to a new level and hopefully come up with some actual solutions and not just this like Google Google thing, you know? I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and sort of ask <clears throat> my name is Madeline. I'm a PhD student in anthropology. So forgive me if this is uh, a sort of a given in the legal realm, but I have a, another definitional, definitional question about ethics. And what do you mean when, you, when, when we say ethics? And in anthropology, that's not a given, so forgive me if that is a clear-cut answer here. Uh, I don't know. I don't, right, like, I'm inclined to just pull up my browser and look up the definition of ethics. I you brought up Kant. I wasn't sure if you have any kind of judgmental. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm not an ethicist, but what's, what is your definition of ethics, and do you feel like what I've been talking about fits in that space or not? Sure. I guess my, my sort of question would be how we define, how we define whether ethics are relational or categorical would change how we would be able to evaluate some of the questions maybe about animals, about labor, or about, it's, it's more of a question about how you're framing your research. I guess. Yeah, I guess, I guess I haven't done that and should. Um, my, you know, off the top of my head, I feel like systems of ethics are kind of 
a social contract. We all agree that you know this behavior is generally desirable. This behavior is generally not desirable, and you know that shifts depending on culture, depending on what we all degree, uh, agree on. But like that, that would be how I feel about ethical systems, not as absolutes, but it's kind of something we agree on together. I don't know if that okay, answers so your that, question. That's fine. It's just how we treat each other. That's fine. I don't. Oh, sure. Um, hi, I'm Nathan uh, Bergman Fellow and a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab. Um, what struck me about your talk, which is really interesting, is how uh, in some ways, while we have machines becoming more personal, we also have people becoming less and less like people, in some cases online, where you have systems like Mechanical Turk, where people are doing work that, to the user, looks like it's something that a machine just did. And, and I wonder um, if we're actually, like what you're talking about is gesturing towards an ethics around personas or identities and how we treat identities. We might have a, another category for the ethics of how we like treat people within systems and another category for how we treat like the decisions that algorithms are making. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that idea of like persona um, uh, and how that might fit into the, the robots. Yeah, that, that's a super interesting thought. I've never thought about that. Do you know anyone who has written anything on that? Or did it... So I think, you know, some of the work on like the Turing test and ELISA might be one direction to look. Um, uh, beyond that, I think we see work on pseudonyms and fake personas in online conversations. Um, I think there's some research on ethics in story situations, like the research on ethical behavior within interactive video games, um, where people are exposed to opportunities to harm uh, avatars and characters within video games that they know might not have a person. There were, for example, uh, there was research that tried to reproduce the uh, Milgram experiments in video games and did uh, measure, measurements on like people's effective state uh, in that and tried to get at a sense of whether people felt that those situations were similar or not. And again, you know, this is all constructed around these, um, uh, these debates about the ethics of choices to harm and uh, like how people construct those ideas. But I'm sure there's other, there's other work around a broader set of ethical questions as well. Yeah, I mean, what fascinates me most about all that stuff is whether there's a difference between online and the physical world. So whether, you're, whether that changes the whole persona idea and also the willingness to harm, et cetera. So, and then that's something that I'm going to be exploring more. But yeah, I, I am interested also in this whole persona question. There was, they recently, there was this experiment where people were given I'm not sure if it was a robot or an object. I don't remember. Maybe someone knows it. But um, one group was given given this thing with a narrative, and it like had a name, and it came from somewhere. And the other people were just given the thing. And the people who with the narrative, they you know bonded much more strongly with the thing. They wanted to keep it. They liked it more, etc. And so I wonder. I wonder about that type of thing and also, you know, whether that's different online and offline, kind of. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Kate, I wanted to go back on the question about free software and robots. Sorry, I'm Camille and I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center, thanks. Um, and, and I think that as in many debates we're having, de focusing it on drones sort of tricks the debate, even though it's a really good point that you know, if we, if we think too much about free software and drones, we're going to get tricked into debates that we don't like. But you can also think about it in terms of cars, and as we're going into robot cars, see what it's going to mean for people. And I think that it's going to turn out not to be a question of, you know, we want to sh see who makes the ethical decisions that are implied, but truly really a question of autonomy. And as we think, you know, through the fact that most of the cars that we're driving on the roads already have antennas that, you know, put them on the network and already have software in them that makes driving decisions, even, even if they're small. The question of autonomy becomes a question of, 
can the software allow us to see if there's backdoors in it? And it's not a weird, you know, crazy science fiction question because we see through, through the legal work that's being debated that there is a willingness of governments and of companies to put backdoors in the softwares. And, you know, ultimately it becomes in the car situation a question of who's, who's driving your car and these robots, who's truly giving them orders. So I think that for this question, putting, you know, thinking through frameworks that are not the drones framework or the military frameworks, but, you know, that are sort of to the frameworks that you offer, things that we're driving with, being with, and, you know, that are closer to us, helps us see the questions that we're gonna see. Yes. Yeah, so am, am I getting you correctly that you're, you're talking about surveillance issues? Because, there, um, I mean, that's, that's a big one, but also I think the whole liability question and like harm question comes in there too. Actually, this ties into the intellectual property as well. It's, so what I see happening is that we're gonna have platforms that you know, maybe they'll start out open, but then if you have like different types of software coming onto these platforms that are programmed by all you know, different types of people and then physical harm occurs, and how you're gonna assign responsibility there, it, you know, if, if you're gonna assign responsibility to the platform, to the manufacturer of the platform under, you know, current product liability laws that will totally discourage having open platforms and will make everything proprietary. Or if you're gonna make some exception like we do for you know, Facebook or we do for, I guess for Android tablet platforms. Like if, you're, if, you're making, if you make an Android tablet and someone downloads an app that was made by somebody else that ends up losing all of your data, then you can't sue the platform. Or at least I, I, I think we've made an exception there. So what's gonna happen when the damage happens in the physical world and when it's a car causing like physical damage? Um, so that's, that's an issue. But, and, and then the back door thing. I mean, like I said, there, there are not enough people thinking about this and there are no answers and this technology already exists. So we need to be thinking about this more. Hi, uh, Rich Ferrante. I have a, a question around adaptability, the adaptation of the algorithms, right? And certain things are, especially around elder care, because I'm thinking in terms of assisted living for people with cognitive disability. So things are going to be, let's say, ethical just in a fairly straightforward sense, you know, let's say standard, what we'd agree on in this room it's going to be different depending upon the cognitive ability of the person that you're caring for. And you're going to need to adapt, the algorithms are going to need to adapt as the person probably declines. And I, th how, I think there's issues around thinking that through, like are you going to adapt too quickly? Are you going to do too little? How are caregivers going to be able to change those adaptation rules as the patient progresses. So do you know anyone working on that kind of thing? Or? Um, I don't know. Any, I mean, we're already seeing like social robots being used in, in elderly care. I don't know of any, any of them that adapt their behavior, but that's... It's coming. That's, it's coming, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what your question is. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure the companies selling these robots are going to be very interested in making algorithms that will, you know, respond to patients' needs. Right, but I think that there's a question of what a good response is. Yes, oh, right? and absolutely. It, and there's going to potentially be a liability issues around that, uh, and certainly ethical issues around that. Again, think of the dementia patient that may start wandering and you're going to prevent them from wandering? Or are you going to prevent them from wandering if there's a fire in the house? Or are you going to, you know, there's, those kind of things are just going to come up. Yeah, so, um, I mean, in general, what we should try to do with, with these robots in elderly care and childcare is have them supplement and not replace actual care. I mean, if, 
if the robot is replacing a human in stopping the patient from wandering around, that's probably not optimal because if there's a fire, you know, that'll lead to harm. If there's no human around to take care of them, you know, it's probably better than nothing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely an issue. It's like the most, <laughs> most questions I'm just like, yeah, that's totally an issue. Someone should be working on that. Why aren't you? <laughs> Hi, my name is John Weaver. Uh, I'm an attorney and author, and I actually have a book coming out about this in the near future. But oh. so I, I just want to, um, I have a branch out question from what we've been talking about so far. The, I read your paper from the We Robot conference that talked about social robots and um, and comparing it to animal rights law, and a lot of it seemed to be focused on reactive or re laws in reaction to how we interact with robots. So the the, uh, the idea seemed to be that the robots come out of the market. We interact with them somehow, and then out of that interaction, there's a demand for these laws to protect robots in some way. Have you given any thought to what would be ideal, say, proactive laws in the face of this technology? You mean not waiting for societal demand and just saying what laws would be optimal? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a, a model that you think should be introduced. Well, um, you know, the, the idea that, you know, we might want to protect these robots for, to encourage good societal values is meant to be provocative. So I'm not saying, yes, we absolutely need to do this. Like, I want to have a conversation about it. But I think that that, that might be, you know, worth a thought. Uh, that whether or not people start clamoring for, for rights, you know, it might be a good idea to think about this and think about implementing it. Why not? Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, other than that, what do you think? It, what I would like to see ideally is um, for us to get ahead of the technology. And you know, there's sort of a danger in legislating too soon, where we, what we think the industry is going to do, or we think the market is going to do, and yeah. we, we have regulations that does nothing like that. That's, that's a problem. Um, but looking at some of the, the history of recent big technological changes, it seems like if we don't get ahead of it soon, we never really catch up because it moves too fast. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, like I was just talking about this whole like protecting social robots idea, but like with regard to the other issues that uh, we've touched on, yes, we need people being proactive, coming up with solutions to you know these issues and proposing legislation. Um, I, I really think that needs to happen. Hey, uh, Andy Sellers, Berkman Fellow. Um, I want to throw out a thought about robo-exceptionalism for a second. So you mentioned the PLEO study, which is a fascinating thing that you did. And, and you drew the analogy from there to pets. And for me, I can't make that leap yet. I don't love any piece of technology as much as I love my dog. I see nothing on the frontier getting close <laughs> to that. You could, of course, have gone another way with it. You could compare the PLEO to just a stuffed animal dinosaur. So what is it about the, the PLEO, the robotic dinosaur, that's different than the same test done with a stuffed animal and, or a pinata? And I will cite the scientific study of Toy Story, where, of course, Sid, the evil guy next door, abuses his toys. And that's a signal that Disney sends us that he's you know, not so right. So. Why is it that you think, a, or do you think, that a robotic dinosaur would be different than a stuffed dinosaur under the same test conditions, and why? So, uh, it's not just that I think, also, Sherry Turkle has done some really fascinating work on this and on children and the gray area, and she says that children do distinguish, you know, between stuffed animals and robotic objects, and even though they know that the robot isn't alive, <laughs> they are confused. There is this gray area where they're they're not sure whether it feels pain and so forth. And I think a lot of that, that is movement. So we are hardwired to respond to things moving in, in ways that we subconsciously associate with something that's alive. So there's that. Um, I like the idea of filling robots with candy and seeing if then people are willing to smash them. <laughs> <laughs> there's also this great... Um, I gave it the first time I ever gave a talk on this. This woman asked a question. She was like, "Well, I would have absolutely no problem destroying a robot. You know, does that make me a bad person?" And 
I wanted to say, yes, next question. <laughs> like, there's, we see, you know, uh, there's, there are studies on um, people who, who lack empathy in, and you see that lack of empathy in all different kinds of areas and in their interactions and, you know, but I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure your dog is awesome. I, I like my robot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rowan Curran, a research associate at Forrester Research. Um, I'm sort of interested in the expanded definition of robots, including uh, sort of autonomous software agents um, that we are interacting with on various levels in the sort of very light versions in Google Now and Siri and whatnot. And I was wondering whether you thought there was a large overlap between the physical robots that are out in space and us interacting with them and the software robots, and whether there's also a chance for the robots to sort of uh, to channel our behavior by encouraging us to make certain decisions or by suggesting certain things rather than just encouraging us to not hurt them um, and to not, you know, fill them <laughs> with candy and explode them. So, yeah, um, I think that there are some differences between, you know, algorithms and physical robots. Uh, so for one thing, this type of projection tends to happen more with physical things. For another thing, people tend to just generally tend to react very viscerally to physical things, like in, in the case of privacy, like if a robot is watching you, that's going to freak you out more than if the NSA is watching you in general. Um, uh, with regard to whether robot, like whether, <laughs> so not to undermine everything that I've just said here, but I, <laughs> I do wonder, like, you know, say McDonald's gets its hand on a bunch of like children's toys that that are social robots and interacting with the kids socially, and the the toys are like telling the kids to eat more McDonald's, and the kids are responding to that. Like that is something that we also need to think about and and talk about. I think when it starts to happen, that can be used for good and for evil. Hi, I'm Ron Newman, a software developer. I was, two things, the minor thing is I'm wondering if there's a better term we can use than anthropomorphism, because it seems like what you're talking about isn't so much, you know, people attributing human attributes to the robots as, as, as attributing animal attributes to them. Uh, the more substantive point is, do you think the physical form of the robot has some effect on how people would deal with it in this way? For instance, you know, we don't have a very uniform idea of animal, of animal protection, well, it's really bad to kill, dog, to torture dogs or cats or honeybees or butterflies. It's perfectly fine to do it to rats and houseflies and mosquitoes. Um. Yeah. Um, with regard to anthropomorphism, I mean, from what I understand, the term also applies to, you know, our projections onto animals because really it's just about identifying things that we relate to. But, you know, I'm, I'm willing to rethink that term. Um, with regard to, you know, the shape of, of the things or the design of the things, I think that makes all of the difference in the world. And I think that, you know, one of the reasons this could become an issue is because, you know, animals can be cute or not cute, but if social robot designers want to make something that's incredibly endearing to you, there are certain attributes that they can make use of. And, while that might vary a little bit among cultures, like we do seem to be hardwired to respond to certain things like big eyes, et cetera. So yes, and, and you know, one idea for, I guess, you know, preventing this is to mandate that all social robots be, you know, look horrifying or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna work, but, it, but yes, that, that makes all of the difference. Tim Davies uh, at the Buckman Center. I want to maybe look at that, that question of theories of ethics and, and of law, because it strikes me a lot of what you're saying fits very much with an idea of virtue ethics, in which ethics is about the character we have as people and whether harming the robot creates a, a negative character, yet law is often based much more on consequentialist and, and, and uh, Kantian theories of ethics, of, of rules and very strict, not so much about our, our character. I think exploring those theories of ethics will be really valuable here, but I also wanted to, to perhaps suggest another term from anthropomorphism, which is simulation, which is the simulation of a harm is something in some places in law we already 
uh, recognised to be deeply problematic. So whether it's child abuse images, even simulated rather than actual, are seen as deeply problematic legally. And I wonder if that, that idea rather of the, the character of the thing being the, the legally and ethically significant thing, whether it's the character of our, of our act towards the thing and what that simulates, what that um, relates to might be a more uh, key part of the ethical and legal um, question. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's, those are great thoughts. Um, I have thought a little bit about, you know, me saying torturing robots because, you know, can you really torture a robot? No, not really, but you can behave in a certain way and our behavior can be categorized in a certain way. But it's, uh, yeah, it's not about the thing, it's about our behavior. So, thanks. Hi, I'm Saul Tenenbaum. I'm a citizen journalist here in Cambridge. First, I'd love to have Ethan's ethical arms race. I think we need it. Um, <laughs> but I'd, I'd like to go back to the comment you made about um, robots being worked to death and that they don't really seem to mind it. Um, I mean, that's a design decision. Um, I mean, that they're, you know, that they're working, you know, 24 by 7. And it's not really abstract either because if you go through a factory that's you know partially roboticized i mean the work is being paced by the the robots and the factories are full of the normal cues that uh, you know you know the robots are waiting for the humans rather than the other way around whether it's parts you know whatever or a, you know a robot being shut down for um repair um, and that also sort of loops back to some of the use cases where you started with, you know, where robots are, you know, being specifically designed to be worked to death, that is clearing landmines or in more dangerous areas. And the fact that, you know, even when the robot is specifically, you know, designed to absorb harm that we'd rather inflict on a machine than a human, you know, even hardened military are saying, no, don't let that landmine, you know, blow off the leg. Um, I, I'm not sure what that says, but I think it, it, there's something profound in there. Um, I mean, if we're, you know, the, the contradiction between, you know, they don't seem to mind, but we seem to mind them being worked to death, plus the, you know, the social cues we're getting from, you know, and, you know, factory robots just working endlessly. It seems to me to be the same, you know, as the McDonald's case of, you know, eat more Big Macs, um, you know, work like a robot. Um, there seems to be sort of an ethical worker case there. Um, care to comment? I, I'm glad you brought this back up because I dismissed the thought too easily before. I really think, you know, <laughs> that, that in terms of signaling to people, this could be something fun to explore, this the whole robot worker ethics thing. Um, I don't think that Walmart would need to have a food drive for its its robots necessarily, <laughs> but I, I am going to think a little bit more about this. I think that's a really fun fun thing to explore. So actually, Sal's point was almost exactly what I wanted to say, and just adding one more thing, which is just the really sharp contradiction this proposal like so you're proposing a sort of uh, a universalizing way of thinking of robots but we you've also described robots which we use in two very different kinds of ways one of which we use to sort of um, be as human like as possible and to sort of replace human functions because it's too expensive to get people like we can't hire one person for every elderly person but maybe we could buy one robot for every elderly person and that would sort of solve some of those needs um, we're trying to get a robot to do things as close to a human as possible um, to serve these sorts of niches and then you know Sal brought up this other set of circumstances where we get robots um, to do all the things we don't want humans to do. Um, which, which actually, in some ways, like there are already analogs, which, which I think creates some problems for creating a sort of universalizing set of ethics, because we have these really divergent set of purposes for what we want to do with the robots. Like, you know, the robots that we're sending to go into nuclear fallout places, like, you know, we're sending them there to be destroyed because we don't want to be destroyed. And then these other things, um, you know, we're using in very different ways. I think there are also parallels that go back to animals, too, you, you know, the canaries and the 
coal mine were animals that we used to die before humans had to die. Um, and so we, so we already have kind of, you know, ethical frameworks of, you know, as you brought up before, we treat certain animals and certainly like, we, you know, it is, it is not appropriate to like, you know, to strangle a canary in a cage to death. It is appropriate to take a canary down into a coal mine so it dies before a human does. Um, so some of these things are sort of contextual too. That's probably more just repeating what Sal brought up, which is a good point. <laughs> No, but I really, like, that's why I, I try to limit the definition of the robots that I'm talking about here to robots that are specifically designed to interact with us socially, because if you broaden that to all robots and say we need to treat all robots in a respectful manner, then you can't have these military robots, you can't have, you know, factory robots. Um, I think it gets very complicated and messy, so there's kind of an arbitrary cut off for me at least. Although I, I do see your point and but the whole question also of the the military robots that are specifically made to go and be destroyed um, don't make them shape like stick insects you know that's <laughs> people need to be conscious of what they're designing and and their and the effects on us. Um, yeah. Hi uh, Boris Anthony um, Nokia in Berlin, as sort of a random seat in this room, perhaps. Um, it, this is a really complex topic, obviously, right? And and we're trying to sort of uh, perceive something through the fog with with, and we're trying to figure out the calibration for how we're supposed to measure these things and, and notions of like it, first questions of, well, what do you mean by robot, um, and and anthropomorphism, and what is sentient, what is alive, and. How do we attribute, in what cases do we give anthropomorphic, uh, convey that, that sense onto something that's moving? I sense, you know, there might be a job of structuring this conversation with um, attributes and levels of things. For example, what degree of autonomy do we perceive in the thing? What degree of responsibility do we attribute to it if it does something right or wrong? Um, what amount of decision-making power do we give it or not? And these might be some of the factors involved in, in then saying, how do we react to this? And how do we, um, as a culture, respond to it? As, as ethics encode that into law, into policy, into code, right? I, I sense there's a calibration process, which is sort of ongoing in this room. And we're going from very high conceptual levels to use case scenarios, really, like almost production level, like, oh, that's a design decision, which is true. Um, that's sort of a random ramble, as I often do. Um, Ethan's shaking his head. <laughs> um, I'm going to be that guy who doesn't have a question, really. But I'll also finish with, there's probably a long list of Japanese anime I would love to share with you, <laughs> which, which tackles this head on culturally in primetime television. And it's, it's fascinating to see the Japanese approach to it. Yes. And it's almost the same comment I used to make when I used to visit the Berkman Center you know, earlier in the decade, which is, you're talking about privacy. There's not a Japanese person in the room. They have a completely different perception of what you're talking about. And I think that's something to keep in mind as well. I just sort of want to lob that in. Yeah. Uh, the, the reaction to the technology is very different depending on your culture. The cultural reaction, yeah, that's true. Um, in certain parts of Asia, they're very much more accepting of robots as beings and as participants in society. Like they've already kind of adopted that that approach. Whereas in our Western society, we're kind of indoctrinated by these science fiction films that generate this like fear of the robot revolution, and we also, you know, kind of have this background of believing that living things have a soul and non-living things don't. So that that creates all of these cultural differences. Um, with regard to, you know, uh, how much autonomy a, a robot actually has and how what what its inner inner you know design is, I would note that there's a significant difference between what robots are capable of and what we perceive them to be capable of. Um, so there's that to think about in social perception versus inherent you know, intelligence of the robots. The robots are not smart. They're not getting any, like they're not reaching science fiction levels anytime soon. But I think that the projection that we have onto them is going to be an issue far sooner than, than it actually matches what they can do. Yeah. Agreed. 
So I'm really glad that we're going in the direction of science fiction, because I was, I was certain that we weren't going to get to this day without talking about Philip Dick and, and uh, Isaac Asimov. Um, but, and I think that's entirely appropriate, not just because we can talk about robot-on-robot -robot ethics, which you get way often in science fiction stories, but because there is one thing that's really valuable about the story approach, which is that uh, stories are very often ways of structuring or identifying or sharpening points of ethical dilemma. And I wonder in the context of your research, and this is a question, um, of if whether you have started to look back at this kind of 50 year history of um, American, Soviet, Asian, futuristic writing that is also all about these kind of finding and declaring and exploring these ethical dilemmas of which these stories, that's the point of these stories. Yeah, so uh, probably one of the reasons I got into this is because I read way too much sci-fi as a, a kid and a young adult. So I have read a bunch, and I'm a huge fan. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of these questions have been explored. I'm a little bit, I find that a lot of the robot ethics questions in science fiction deal with you know, inherent qualities of robots. So back to you know, robots being actually capable of feeling things or being intelligent. I don't know if any of you have started watching that new show on Fox that premiered yesterday and the day before called Almost Human. It's, you know, it's about what happens when robots can actually have emotions and experience things. And it's said in 2048, which is entirely unrealistic. Like we're not gonna have that type of technology by then. Um, and while, while it's interesting to think about and fascinating, and you know, maybe we, we should be philosophically thinking about these questions, it's not a very practical discussion because we don't know what type of world we're gonna be living in when those questions actually come up. So I'm more interested in, you know, and, and probably what, what brought me onto this projection thing becoming an issue far sooner is one of the differences between, for instance, Blade Runner, the movie, and the book by Philip K. Dick is that in the book, he falls in love with the android, but she doesn't love him back. And he knows that, but he falls in love with her anyway. So that, in, in the movie, it's like Hollywood romance and, and whatever. It's still a fantastic movie, and everyone should see it who hasn't. But um, yeah, so I, science fiction is, is important and does, does answer some of these questions and some questions that we're not there yet. Chris Peterson, Center for Civic Media. First of all, I want to go back to Andy's point, because I spent most of my teenage years blowing up Furbies in the woods. <laughs> and I'm now wondering, was I a sociopath? Or was I yes. just a teenager in New Hampshire? No. Or maybe those are the same thing? If it was, <laughs> let me answer that. If it was Furbies, that's normal. Furbies are fucking annoying. I would destroy them as well. I was going to say, isn't your picture in Civic like holding a skinned Furby? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just so we're on the same page. Now, the substantive question is this. Um, we were talking about liability, uh, especially for autonomous systems. Um, and there's a really interesting alternate legal history from uh, early modern, pre-modern Europe, um, where inanimate or animal um, actors were often put on trial. Um, so, for example, it was not uncommon for if a vase fell off of a, of a ledge and fell and killed somebody, the vase would be put on trial and um, destroyed. And one really interesting case in a Brazilian colony in the 1700s, um, a bunch of termites ate out the foundation um, from a church, and the termite colony was put on trial and appointed a defense attorney. Um, who argued that the church had taken all the wood from the surrounding area and therefore the church was partially responsible and the judgment was to set aside, uh, set aside a pile of wood so the termites would have something else to feed on. Uh, we look at that somewhat condescendingly, right? But I do wonder if there's an interesting space to think about emergent autonomous algorithms, actors, robots that are not, that often have properties or behaviors not intended or capable of being built by their designers, where we might imagine things like, okay, this uh, learning high frequency trading algorithm developed and is really bad and it should be put to death. Um, can we think about a criminal legal regime that is capable of saying, of, di of distinguishing between the builders of systems 
and those systems as emergent semi-autonomous or fully autonomous actors from a legal liability perspective? <laughs> so I would say it depends on what you believe the purpose of a criminal law system is, right? Is it to reduce crime and harm, or is it to satisfy some societal notion of justice and prevent anarchy by giving people the sense that justice is being fulfilled somehow? And so if you subscribe to the latter and people are very upset that, you know, a robot killed someone and they just want to, they want vengeance, they want the robot to be destroyed before their eyes, then sure, you know, whatever, social contract, man, I'm, I'm on board if that's what people want. I kind of, <laughs> I wonder if, you know, we might want to think more about setting incentives for, for harm reduction in those cases. Like, we don't put little children on trial if they can't well, I mean, yes, we do sometimes, but only if we believe that they had some responsibility for what they did and had some inherent capability to understand what they were doing. This is one of those European American things. We, we said it's <laughs> 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 We try, we try 12 year olds as adults. <laughs> I don't think we're any friends with a five, seven year old. Mm. But yeah, good point. Well, I, again, I mean, it depends on on what purpose you're trying to serve with a with a justice system. There was, I wasn't it called Knoxville's law or the the law you're talking about, where you know they would put the neighbor's cow to death if it trampled your corn and stuff. That's existed in human history, and if there's societal desire for that, then you know. <laughs> It feels like we're caught here between the human gift for imputing meanings where meanings haven't been imputed before. And this animal, this machine is what I say it is kind of thing. And we police that human inclination with what Austin would call felicity conditions. So you can call your pet or a machine anything you want, but if, unless certain conditions are satisfied, it's not accepted as a, as a proper constitution of the object in the social world. Uh, so the question here is, this sort of, it's a kind of an anthropological issue. It's at what point to do our, so, and you can get an acknowledgement of these felicity conditions in an ethnographic interview. You can say to somebody, look, you've turned this robot into a sibling or a child, and they'll say, well, it's really just me. They'll back off, they'll acknowledge the felicity condition, and, 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 and they disengage with the imputation of meaning. Do you see any e evidence that these felicity conditions are softening or changing, and what's the kind of public forum in which people will kind of license themselves to, to move away from those felicity conditions or to rewrite the conditions? That, oh, wow, I think that's a really interesting question, and I think that's obviously something that still needs to be explored in this space. So, you know, go do it, please. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 or help me, you know, I, I'd, I'd be interested in exploring that as well, you know, in experimentally you know, or by, you know, talking to people. I, I think that that's, that's a super interesting question. Hello, Nathan again. Um, I wonder if it's actually ethically better to kick the plea out. Um, there have been... Uh, like there's a long tradition of argumentation that say stories and role play are a really important part of human development. Understanding different alternatives, exploring empathy, and having conversations about what's right and wrong. So like Alison Gopnik, looks, who looks at childhood development, talks about the importance of the imagination and having kids role play things that are wrong or factually incorrect as a way to think about what's right. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, whether it might actually be uh, morally valuable to people to put themselves into situations where they could actually do very nasty things uh, to robots as a way to explore ethics. I think that's a super, super interesting question. I think but my intuition would be that it really depends on the context. So if you're having a conversation around it, then probably it could be something valuable. If you're not having a conversation around it, then that does raise the question. It raises, you know, the same question of does violence in video games translate to the real world or not? But it raises it on 
what I think is a different level because it's in a physical space. And, you know, there, there are different areas where, where this is going to become more of a question and already is. I don't know if you guys saw, this is probably not something I should bring up on the live stream, but I'm going to do it anyway. So recently there was this like virtual little girl going around and catching people who were watching child pornography. And that raises a whole slew of questions because this wasn't an actual girl. So were they even breaking the law and why is that unethical and, you know, you know, should we be developing 13-year-old boy robots to give to priests so that they can do whatever they want and then they'll leave the real boys alone? And that's this, this nature versus nurture question that's never really been answered that, you know, I think with, with uh, social robots could become an issue or maybe even an area to study that more. Thank you guys, thank you.